Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Around the Fire with Momo. Today, we have the carnivore yogi on. So I really love your Instagram handle. Could you talk us about that and about your background, please? Sure. I started my Instagram probably about almost four years ago. It was more like a joke um, because I had been suffering. Yeah, I'd been suffering with a lot of health issues and was just super frustrated. And a good friend of mine, her name's Dr. Rimka. She's a functional medicine doctor. I had talked to her and I said, you know, I'm having all these issues with joint pain and eczema and my stomach was a mess. You know, my gut was a mess. I was a lot bloated all the time and, um, had a lot of gas and indigestion, couldn't sleep well. And she said, well, you know, we could run a lot of labs for you and try to figure out things, or you could just try the carnivore diet. And I thought that was the craziest thing that I had ever heard. (laughs) I was like, no way, just eat meat. Don't eat any vegetables at all. Um, And she's like, yeah, you get try it. And so I finally just said, why not? You know, what have I got to lose? And at the time, I mean, I've been teaching yoga for over 12 years now and I was practicing, I was taking, you know, practicing a lot of yoga, but I had gotten to a point where I couldn't practice anymore because my body was just so, was such a mess. And so about two weeks, three weeks after doing carnivore, I was back to doing the type of yoga. I really love to do like more athletic type of yoga, more physical type of yoga. And I didn't have any pain and I felt really good. And then I was kind of like looking around the room and realizing like most of the people in there were vegetarian or vegan. (laughs) And so that's how I kind of came up with the idea of making a page called carnivore yogi because all the yogis I knew were vegan or vegetarian. And so it was kind of a joke that it started that way. And I just started, um, I used the Instagram page to follow other accounts that were also doing carnivore to help keep myself motivated. And it just, and and I started just sharing what I was eating every day because people were really curious, like what in the heck do you eat if you just eat meat? And so I started sharing that every day. I just would post all my meals and then, uh, the pro, you know, people just started following me and it kind of had, it has evolved into today. I never would have thought that that joke would have evolved into a podcast, a YouTube channel and, um, creating courses and doing all kinds of, and coaching and things like that for people. But it's, uh, it's been a interesting journey the last four years for sure. Whenever someone tells me that they are taking yoga classes and everyone around them is vegetarian and they find it difficult to talk about diet Uh, first Mm -hmm. I say well you don't have to talk about diet but if you think that there's a contradiction look at this account and the reason that I uh, followed you was that the message was clear when I looked at the Instagram ID I I knew that yeah this person is a yogi and they are carnivore and Mm -hmm. I started following you and it is understandable in any language because yogi is yogi everywhere and carnivore is a term that even if you don't know much English for example my friends who are Persian speakers they recognize the word because we use the word carnivore in technical I mean in in its technical sense and um, that's a very informative and uh, awareness raising joke and yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, whenever someone brings that up, I um, just uh, send them your uh, a link to, to, to your page. And how did you improve uh, physically after doing uh, carnivore? And uh, I mean, when you were doing yoga, did you did your joints improve? Mm-hmm. You, uh, what happened exactly? Well, they just stopped hurting. I mean, I was, I was doing Ashtanga yoga at the time, which is very physical and a lot of, you know, requires a lot of flexibility, a lot of pressure on your joints. Cause there's a lot of kind of jumping and, you know, landing correctly. And so it is hard on your joints. And so that was probably contributing to a lot of my pain. And so doing carnivore, I was able to start doing the practice without having all the pain that I was having, like my joint pain completely went away and I actually noticed an increase in flexibility. Um, 
just physical strength was a lot greater, just a lot of physical things that I noticed um, from switching to mostly plants and a little bit of meat to all meat and no plants. And how did you change mentally? And was it a challenge for you? I mean, when I listened to your other interviews, uh, I don't remember you talking about it being a challenge for you, a big challenge for you making this transition. I mean, did you have any kind of internal conf conflict apart from the fact that we are always told that we should eat our veggies? As a yogi, I mean, did you have any conflicts? Well, I just, I kind of felt guilty in the beginning. I was like, well, I guess I'm just not, you know, doing what everyone says I'm supposed to do in the yoga world. I did feel guilty. And then that drove me to want to learn more and want to understand what does the text actually say? How much of this is people passing things down and creating rules and how much of it is actually the yoga, you know, like. The, the pure when you get down to the roots. And so, yeah, at first I was like, I felt kind of like, oh, I'm doing something wrong. And then it spurred me to learn more. It spurred me to talk with more experts to actually see what is written in the ancient yogic texts and the Vedas about meat and about, and, and I, what I found is that meat was used medicinally mm. in the Vedas and the ancient yoga texts. Um, milk and honey are food of the yogis, you know, that's how it's referred to. And what the people that made meat wrong and bad were not necessarily tied um, to these ancient texts. This, they, were, they, they interpreted it that way, right? And mm -hmm. once you say something enough times, enough people fall into it and, and believe that that's the truth. And so there was that. And then I had to understand, I was like, well, what about the environmental aspect of this? And then that drove me to understanding farming, understanding our food system and deciding not to really participate in the food system as it is, you know, conventional feedlot meat, I try to work with local farmers and, you know, get my meat that way, buy in bulk and understand about regenerative agriculture and how that has the power to actually heal and help our environment. And the way that I was eating before was actually more destructive to the planet and the environment because I was eating foods that were flown in from different countries, you know, Mexico, was you can't get fruit uh if fruit doesn't grow in where i live in the winter time yet i was eating a ton of fruit and so it's being flown over from different countries and so you think about that versus your, your farmer that lives in your area and just going and getting the food from them so i was causing a lot more environmental damage the old way than i was eating than i was the new way with eating meat and so I had to really educate myself and it's been part of what I want to do on my platform is to educate other people and kind of empower them with that knowledge because there is a lot of uh, propaganda out there. And even if you're not a yogi, even if you're just a normal human being walking around, there's a lot of people that are saying that meat is going to kill you. It's going to ruin the environment and it's the culprit, it's the devil. And, and it's, it's a lot of ignorance. There's a ton of ignorance when it comes to understanding agriculture and nature. Really, it's it's about understanding nature more than anything else and how we evolved and how we were meant to live as human beings on the planet. Yeah, I mean, he's going to kill you. He's not just in the yogic um, tradition. When I uh, wanted to do something about my health years ago the first fundamental thing that I changed was to stop uh, to stop eating meat mm -hmm. and thinking that it was going to be uh, good for us and every one of us uh, is floating in this sea of misinformation about mm -hmm. meat and the environmental uh, consequences of it and the health uh, consequences of, of it and none of them is uh, true uh, to go beyond carnivore, we might get back to it. Would you tell us about the other areas that um, you are interested in? 
for example, uh, a quantum healing, was it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after about two years of being carnivore, I was kind of stuck, you know, I just... And I think a lot of it was lifestyle related. I didn't really understand the full picture of nature. Like I was saying, you know, we evolved eating meat. We evolved also outdoors. Mm -hmm. We evolved also connected to nature. And I really had lost that connection um, to nature, to everything. I was very involved with creating my social media profile and, you know, my podcast and YouTube and all of those things. I was spending a lot of time on that, which meant I was spending a lot of time indoors, you know, in this office with the window closed and on my computer and, and on my phone. And, you know, I had started to gain weight. I had started to feel not so great. And, um, at the same time, I had decided I wanted to uh, get pregnant. And so I figured out very quickly that just doing diet alone was not going to be enough for me to have a successful, healthy pregnancy. And so that's when I dove into the world of quantum physics and circadian biology. And I started just very simply. I mean, this stuff is so simple. I mean, it's so complicated. You can make it very, very complicated, but you can also make it very simple. And that's how I prefer to do it. And so I started, you know, getting up for sunrise every day. And it's something I still do. I go, I walk in the morning at sunrise while the sun's coming up. And I went, if I'm indoors, you know, I have a software on my computer called Iris software to block out the artificial light. I have a window open. I wear blue blockers at night and the morning. There's a lot of routines I have to, um, around light. And so I started really studying last year, this importance of light, the importance of circadian rhythms, the importance of, um, healing your mitochondria and understanding that just diet isn't enough to heal the mitochondria that you have to change your lifestyle also. And so I've, yeah, I've just become really passionate about that. I've done um, some advanced studies, some coursework and interviewed a lot of the top experts in the quantum healing um, circadian biology kind of world and just expanded my, my knowledge and expanded my teaching into that area because that was ultimately what did help me get pregnant. It wasn't having, I think the diet helped and it was a good building block but it wasn't the thing. And so, and there's a lot of people, you know, after kind of coaching for a while, when people come to you for coaching, they're having a lot of problems, you know, and a lot of times they are trying to follow the diet perfectly and they're still having a lot of problems. And so this has been the missing piece for me, but also a ton of my clients also that we're just stuck that we're like, I'm trying to do everything that this influencer over here says to do. It's not working. And I'm like, well, do you ever see sunrise? Do you ever go outside? How much time are you on your phone? Are you, you know, like I asked her and asked those questions. And then they're like, why are you asking me that? You know, like that's, that can't mean anything. And I'm like, well, it does. And so yeah, that's kind of where I've shifted my focus to now. I still think the diet is important, but I'm more uh, interested in and feel like it's more effective to focus around your relationship with light. You mean um, it comes first? I think so. I mean, I think that that starts first and having that relationship with light, actually a lot of people, it helps them to be more compliant to a diet because I find mm -hmm. a lot of times people can't, they just are having a hard time sticking to a specific way of eating and they they focus on that. They focus on that. They keep failing. They keep falling off. Or even if they are just focusing on the food, it still isn't moving the needle. They're still feeling terrible. They're still, they still need more support. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of where I'm having people start at this point. And I support them with the nutrition as well. And when you talked about opening the window, how open is, uh, is your window do you open it completely so that sun, sun rays um hit you directly or just open it because i have i live in a room that doesn't have an have a window that can open completely 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I just crack the, when you glass actually blocks out most glass, unless you buy special like quartz glass, which mm. is hard to find, um, it's going to block out all the beneficial light rays. And we've been told UV light is harmful. It's actually really, really beneficial for the body. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I just have the window it's, you can see behind me, it's just open and, um, there's a screen. So it's blocking a little bit of the light, but not significantly enough. And what that does is it allows my body to know what time it is because mm -hmm. we have this thing called the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It is, um, activated by the light that comes into the eyes and it's attached to the hypothalamus and, the light coming into your eyes, specific wavelengths at specific times of day with specific intensity and brightness tells your body to make specific hormones. So the signal that you're getting from sunrise specifically is turn off melatonin and gradually turn on cortisol. The signal that you get from UVA light, which starts after sunrise, usually 45 minutes or so after sunrise is make pregnenolone, which is our master sex hormone, um, synthesize hormones to make serotonin, dopamine, tryptophan, tyrosine, thyroid hormone. All of those hormones are signaled by UVA light, you know, and then UVB mm -hmm. is when we make the vitamin D, but we're always looking for, and we have these melanopsin receptors on our skin too. So our skin's important also. Um, 90% of the melanopsin receptors are in the eye. The other 10% are on the skin. So our, every, every cell in our bodies is activated by light is interacting with light. And so if you're giving your body a signal by looking at your phone, first thing in the morning, if you look at the phone, you're telling your body it's noon. And then your body says, I need to make enough cortisol for noon, you know? And then <laughs> and so people wonder why their cortisol is too high, right? Or even too low because it's been chronically high for so, so long. And they look at, they want to look at food and they want to look at these other things, but they never consider the fact that the thing that they're looking at all day, their phone, their computer, or the overhead lights, I don't have any lights on in here. I just have the window open. Um, overhead lights in your home also are giving you a signal of it's the wrong time of day. And so there's a symphony that's happening in our body all the time. And our bodies are brilliant. We didn't evolve to be indoors under artificial lights with phones and computers. Those are new. Those are only in the last couple hundred years. Yeah. In the last couple hundred years, we have this increase in diseases and increase in illnesses. Definitely. That's not the only factor our food, the seed oils, GMOs, glyphosate, all that stuff is definitely a player in that. However, if we ignore the light piece, I mean, that's the signal to do, for the body to make the hormones, right? If your signal is wrong, then how confused is your body really going to be? Yeah, uh, nowadays, most of the jobs are done from home, even mm -hmm. after the lockdowns are over. Yeah. And I think there was value to be found in even walking to work and then still being trapped in an environment without direct sunlight. But mm -hmm. the fact that you are outside and you see some uh, sunlight, that was a, a value that most of us, including me, and um, because of my job, are deprived of. Mm -hmm. And um, the days that I am off and I can see the sunlight, I can really feel the dif and difference. And when I remember the times that I didn't have an office job, uh, I really felt differently, recovered faster under the sun, and it mm -hmm. Im improved my sleep and very refreshing. It gave me very refreshing naps during the day. Yeah. And, yeah, which was really vitalizing. And the other uh, things that uh, I, I have noticed that you also do, uh, for example, mouth taping. Are you uh, mm -hmm. continuing with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Because that's another way our body produces nitric oxide, which is mm -hmm. another thing that can help our metabolism um, speed up. It can also help to aid in healing the mitochondria. So everything really goes down to mitochondrial health, right? And um, it, we can also become dehydrated from mouth breathing. There's so many things that we are 
you know, missing the brain gets more oxygen. If you're breathing through the nose, I mean, it's brain metabolism, your heart health, like so many things that are affected by, uh, mouth breathing. And so, and even the structure of your face and jaw changes if you're chronically mouth breathing. So yeah, I tape, um, at night when I sleep and occasionally if I'm doing a workout, that's not super, super intense. I'll do that mm. too. Just, yeah. Just to kind of train my body to be better at breathing in and out of the nose. That's a good idea. Actually, mm -hmm. even if it isn't intensive, I try to breathe through the nose, but that's difficult to do all the time. If there mm -hmm. was something that I put in, I put in my mouth and blocks it without looking weird. Yeah. That would have been good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I also see a lot of um, value in it. And that's one of the reasons I uh, do it religiously and stick to it every day. And uh, when I wake up in the morning, there's no, um, bitter taste in my mouth or yeah uh, and you're not thirsty not... i bet too yeah 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 yep so uh, that's something very, uh, really beneficial and for those who might think that uh, we claim that we are trying to imitate the nature uh, where was mouth taping in the nature well in the past we didn't need that our the shape of our skull the shape of our exactly teeth mm -hmm. Yeah, we've all, we, our jaws have gotten smaller, you know, the fa our facial shape has changed completely. And so, yeah, evolutionarily, no, we probably didn't need to do that, but, uh, now we've evolved, right. And mm -hmm. so it, it is helpful, um, for us to tape the mouth for sure. Yeah. Some days ago, Dr. Chafee posted some pictures of, uh, Native American skulls and the teeth they're totally perfectly aligned straight yeah and yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah that was beautiful if we weren't poisoned and affected by the food that we are eating nowadays mm -hmm. we would have perfectly aligned teeth too well you know it's funny when my daughter was very young you know she was diagnosed with autism and i changed her diet immediately you know very very young before she was even eating a lot of solid foods the first solid foods I was giving her was, was grass fed ground beef, grass fed, uh, bison. And I made little burgers for her and I fried them up in coconut oil. And that's what I would feed her all the time. You know, she loves, that's how she was. That's the food I gave her. Cause that's what I read. You should do for children with autism. You should take away, you know, any processed foods, gluten, you know, anything that could be allergenic. And so it was most, I mostly gave her meat, you know, I did give her some fruits and things like that also, but I have crooked teeth. Like my dentist is like, oh, we should give you Invisalign. I'm like, maybe one day, but I just, ha I'm not in the mood. Um, but my daughter and you know, my husband had to have braces. I had to have braces and then my teeth are still messed up. Mm. Her teeth are perfect, perfect. And I gave her tons of meat, tons of meat when she was really little and then all the way through childhood. And she's, I mean, her teeth are amazing. And she, I was like worried because she has autism and I'm like, oh, how are we going to deal with the braces and all the teeth problems? Her teeth have been amazing. So I do think that, you know, even if you are raising a child now, I think you can give them a better chance starting them really young, eating a lot of meat. I think the, the facial structure, the jaw structure has the ability to adapt to that. Yeah. And uh, let's move on or maybe move back kind of, because maybe it has something to do with quantum healing. Um, could you talk about uh, the value of grounding and how you benefit from it? Sure. So there's a lot of benefits from grounding that have been scientifically studied and shown because some people are like, oh, it's not real. Ooh. Yeah, exactly. I get that a lot. And I'm like, actually, there's a ton of science behind this now. And it's been scientifically shown 45 minutes a day. You don't even have to do that all at once. You could do five minutes here, five minutes there. That's what I tell my clients. I'm like, just take a 10 minute break, take a five minute break, just when you can take a break. Cause you should be trying to take a break to go outside at least once an hour. If you can 
barefoot, you know, and it's been shown to reduce inflammation, to increase blood flow. And the cool thing is it actually hydrates us. So if you don't understand the water inside the body, it's hard to understand. I mean, I'm, I'm doing a webinar, um, next week about hydration and everyone's like, oh, it's just about drinking water and getting the perfect amount of, uh, minerals. And it, that's, it's not that simple. It's about the water inside your body. We have this water inside of our body called exclusion zone water. You know, everyone says that we're, our bodies are made up of water. Well, yeah, our bodies are like actually like 98, 99% water molecules. And the easy water is that water inside the body. It's all over. And when you're grounding, you're building your exclusion zone water that the electrons from the earth, because our earth is negatively charged, hit the body, blood starts to, um, blood flow starts to increase. And then again, that easy water in the body actually builds sunlight and, you know, UV light, infrared light, it builds the easy water as well up to four times. So you can expand that water inside your body. You can hydrate yourself and you can get energy because the, the amount of water, the easy water in the body determines the amount of energy that we have at a given time. So that's another way to, to get energy grounding because you're, you're expanding the easy water in your body. And is it uh, important what kind of surface uh, it is? For example, if it is a tiled... Uh pathway or if it is a concrete or asphalt way would it still have some impact or does it have to be the soil the grass asphalt will not work um, electrons cannot be conducted through asphalt and wood also is another one that isn't going to work but uh, concrete as long as it's not sealed concrete will work dirt sand is great, uh, grass, anything, a wet surface, you know, is going to conduct the electricity more into the body. I'm not sure about tile, uh, to be honest with you. I, I don't think that tile is a conductor, but I do know that the concrete is so sidewalks, you know, just as long as it's not sealed concrete that that can conduct. And, uh, Uh, about coffee, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, maybe it is even about a year that you're not drinking coffee. How long has it been? It was February of 2021 that I quit. And so it's uh, over a year. Yeah, it's been a, a little, about a year and a half now that or almost a year and a half that I haven't been drinking the coffee. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was very addicted to coffee. And a lot of people that do carnivore are they end up you know, starting to drink more coffee. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think when we talk about hormone balance, um, coffee is definitely not a good idea, uh, because it makes your cortisol a lot higher as well. And that's the main problem with a lot of hormone imbalance is the cortisol is the root of beginning that imbalance. And so, Yeah, I, you know, I had originally quit coffee because I was trying, I wanted to get pregnant and I knew when I was pregnant, I didn't want to be drinking coffee. I wanted to mm -hmm. do the best thing for the baby. And I had kind of started that process, um, way back at that time, you know, the beginning of 2021 end of 2020 was when I started trying to do things to, um, prepare for pregnancy. And so, yeah, that's, it was hard <laughs> to stop. Um, and I did it very gradually, you know, I did just like, I uh, cut it down. I was drinking like four cups of coffee a day. So then I cut oh. it to two cups. Yeah. I was drinking a lot of coffee. Then I cut it to two. Then I cut it to one, you know, I did that over like a month. And then I went from, um, one cup of regular to a half of regular half decaf. And then I did three fourths decaf, one fourth regular. And then I did one day with the, you know, regular mix with decaf and then one day just decaf. And then I did it like every other day. And then eventually I was like, all right, it's time to have no more of the caffeinated and just get it out of my system. And it took probably a couple months because coffee stays in your system. I don't think people realize that. And I'm a fast metabolizer of caffeine. I've tested my genetics before. 
And I'm actually a fast metabolizer. So people are like, oh, if you're a slow metabolizer, you shouldn't drink coffee. But if you're a fast metabolizer, you can drink coffee. It's no problem. But even if you're a fast metabolizer, it still stays in your body, kind of like sediment, you know? And so after how two, long? I don't know, I think it's different for everybody, but it took about a couple of months for me before I noticed that my, and I don't wear an aura ring anymore. Um, I don't wear any wearables, but it took a couple months in my HRV, which is your heart rate variability, the, uh, quality of your recovery while you're sleeping essentially is, is the HRV that the aura ring is measuring it, it doubled. So <laughs> my body was suffering. It wasn't recovering as well. Could you remind me after how long it doubled? It took two months after, before mm -hmm. it doubled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm convinced that some of the coffee was still hanging out, uh, for a couple mm -hmm. months and my body was taking time to repair. And then all of a sudden I saw it completely double. And so, yeah, that was, that was pretty eye opening. And over Christmas, this, this last year, I just was like, you know, I want to have some coffee. I just was trying to do the fertility journey. I was tired. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just, I want to try some coffee. And the same night that I had coffee, I tested it with my aura ring and my HRV went in half same night. Mm. And so I was like, well, there it is. You know, it's definitely the caffeine, the coffee that cuts my HRV in half. So yeah, this, and I couldn't feel that. Like if you asked me to tell you how I felt, you know, that Monday before I had the coffee and my HRV was looking good versus, you know, let's say I had that coffee on Thursday. If I felt a difference Friday mor morning versus Monday, I didn't really feel a major difference. I had to actually measure it with the ring to know, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so there's, there's a lot of things that there's a lot of functions in our body that happen and that we aren't obvious to us. You know, there's a lot of stuff happening in the background. Yeah, for me, actually carnivore was a helping factor, keto and carnivore that I started to think that, well, yeah, for staying focused, I don't need that coffee that much. And also the other thing was that I'm probably one of the slow metabolizers of coffee mm. and yeah, I do lose my marbles on coffee, oh, <laughs> especially after <laughs> a couple of days, even when I, um, and drink high quality, uh, coffee, mm -hmm. which uh, I would get from a bio shop. It was really good. It didn't give you, it wouldn't give you this kind of kick in, in yeah. it wouldn't hit you uh, at the face in, in the face. It would just take you up slowly and that that was a very good uh, mild coffee that I would consume but even that after one week I would notice that I would uh, I would start to have nightmares and it would even uh. affect me at night and that uh, though I thought that I could go to sleep at the right time still it it did have some effect there on me and uh, what effects can it have to a baby before being born? Well, you know, there's a lot of people that say that caffeine is fine for babies, you know, that you can have like 200 milligrams a day and it's fine, but I don't believe that necessarily. I just feel like if it's, if I'm having great results and I'm repairing better and my body is doing so much better without it, then why not just give the baby like the best chance possible? You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that people say are safe for pregnancy and that are safe for children and safe for babies. And I don't, I don't think it's true, you know, cause I did a lot of things that were safe, you know, for my daughter and she ended up being injured. She ended up being damaged from safe things. And so, you know, I don't trust that, that, um, that information, you know, and I just intuitively say, okay, if it's good for me, it has to be good for baby, you know? Yeah, definitely. That that makes perfect sense. And uh, do you have an idea of what what the culprit was for damaging your your daughter? Um, she had a an injury from uh, getting a flu vaccine. We mm -hmm. she had she got it that morning, and then um, and she was 
fine and talking. I have videos of it because people are like, oh, you're lying, you know, but I have videos of her talking and interacting and being um, a normal, you know, 13 month old. And then we took her for that appointment that night. She was very sick. She was throwing up and she was screaming. And I, I called the doctor. I'm like, what do I do? And they're like, you need to go to the emergency room. Um, and so I went to the emergency room and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with her, but then they found out she had like a double ear infection and they were like, did she have any shots today? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, she's having a reaction to the shot, but she's going to be fine. You know, she's fine. And here's some antibiotics for the infections. And then she never talked again after that. And, you know, it's one of those things people don't believe until it happens to them or, or someone they know. And even if it happens to someone they know, they wouldn't trust them probably. They still, yeah, they still don't necessarily trust because just like with meat, you know, there's a lot of propaganda, there's a lot of brainwashing. And so, yeah, I mean, everyone said those, you know, the flu shot is fine for a baby. Well, <laughs> there's actually more litigation um, for that shot than any other. So, you know, that's, that's one thing that that's when I kind of lost my trust of a lot of what people were saying was safe. This is fine. This is safe. I kind of just stopped uh, trusting what I was Mm. being told and I had to start investigating things for myself. Yeah. And uh, you, when you talked about the things that we considered safe ones, smoking and drinking was safe too for babies right for babies for um, pregnant women a long t- yeah i just posted a, i just did a post the other day that yeah. showed a picture of a pregnant woman smoking and they used to tell uh, pregnant women that if they smoked during pregnancy it would um help the labor and deliver be easily easier wow. be- yeah because the baby would have a low birth weight and that that was a good thing <laughs> wow. so that's how yeah that's how they advertise to pregnant women is they say oh you're gonna have a slim um, small baby and it'll make your delivery easier. Yeah. So smoke cigarettes. (laughs) These things are criminal, right? But it was part of, yeah. So we, you know, I don't try, I don't trust a lot of stuff that people like it's fine. It's uh, really, is it though? Cause Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Some of these things are reversed. For example, we are, everyone knows that uh, a pregnant woman should, shouldn't be drinking, shouldn't be smoking. Right. Yeah, but yeah. so many of these things are not reversed anymore, uh, reversed yet. And I don't have much hope seeing this inertia in in litigations, in guidelines, Mm-mm. and how they change. I, I don't have any hope of any kind of institutional change. Well, follow the money, you know, that's what I yeah. always say. Yeah. It's all, it's all funded. You know, mm-hmm. there's, there's so much money funding pharmaceutical companies. There's so much money funding these fake meat companies, you know, the, the plant burgers and the, you know, the agenda to erase meat and get rid of it and demonize it. All these, it's all the same, you know, mm-hmm. and you just, you just look at the funding behind these things and, you know, you you quite you got a question you have to question mm-hmm. it instead of just looking at some ad or some even some article because there's a lot of great articles now that can convince you of things I'm like wait a minute let's look at some of these studies or who funded the studies you know who who's paying for this um for to convince people that this is the way right mm-hmm. yeah and there's uh, so many people who would uh, react to us that by saying that or just ignoring us by saying that well these are not doctors right we don't have to be doctors to be able to in some way follow the money we don't have to be doctors to see the changes in our own bodies exactly yeah i mean that's the thing that people they just they'll try to dismiss you um that's why I don't, I don't know if that I've ever really talked about my daughter and her story on a podcast before, just because, you know, people are quick to dismiss you. They, um, you know, even the cigarette smoking ad that I put on my Instagram, somebody said I was, uh, spreading 
a fear of the medical establishment and that that was dangerous. And I said, I'm but not. That spreading. was a correct conclusion. I said, well, I hope that you're skeptical now mm -hmm. after reading this. You can decide whether or not you're afraid. I'm not telling anyone to be afraid. Fear is a different thing. I, I don't mm -hmm. think anyone should fear. Having fear is like poison, but you should be skeptical. You know, you should do your own research and make your own decisions. I'm just presenting you with, with information. You know, that's all I'm doing is that this actually was part of our history. So history has a way of repeating itself. And I think it's happening all the time, but people are so they, they are so low dopamine, you know, mm -hmm. they are so addicted to their phones and the news and, you know, that dopamine hit from instant gratification of a like and a follow and this, that, and the other on social media that they're too distracted by being so low dopamine that they just want to be told what to do. They just want to be told this is the answer. Just do this, you know? And it, it even goes in, in these little smaller communities too. You know, there's people that, that say things that are not scientifically backed that have no basis at all. And mm -hmm. that people are so, uh, like I said, so low dopamine that they're just looking for someone to tell them what to do. Um, so I never, I never trust anyone like what they say a hundred percent. I'm like, Oh, that's some good information, but I need to understand this for myself. You know, I need to do my own research and, and see if this is really legitimate. And I encourage everyone else to do that too. Because the responsibility is eventually ours. We are exactly the ones who are living yeah, with yeah, the consequences. It's your body. It's your life you you're you're ultimately deciding what how you feed your body how you surround yourself in your life so if you're going to do that then you should be you should know like you should do your research and make the decision and you know we all are going to make mistakes i've made a ton of mistakes i was vegan for <laughs> a couple of years because i thought that that was the way to health you know um until my health failed me. I had to learn the hard way with that one, but I have definitely made mistakes along the way for sure. Um, because I've done my own research and my own research has been flawed. So yeah, we're going to make mistakes, but ultimately it's up to you. And, uh, this conversation reminds me of the TV series that I was encouraged by you to watch when I was preparing for this interview. Uh, you mentioned Dope Sick and oh, I yeah. binge watched it. Great show. You liked it? Most stuff, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I that's like it. a great example of of how a lie gets, you know, explodes and ends up killing people and injuring people, you know, mm -hmm. because their whole basis for that drug was never even a study. It was a, a letter. <laughs> written in a medical journal yet they kept referencing yeah. a study that never even existed <laughs> so, yeah yeah and they were looking shocking. looking through all the articles in the written form in the hard copy form and they couldn't find it and they eventually realized that it was just a letter mm -hmm. so so much of the the uh so many of the guidelines are like that that mm -hmm. or similar to that for mm -hmm. example, eat less salt. It was just based right. on opinion. Mm -hmm. There was no study to support it. And then this suggestion was made by some uh, reputable person. And they said, okay, bit this and that. It makes some sense. And they started to find some arguments for it. And it just stayed there. It stayed long enough so that it couldn't be moved anymore. Mm -hmm. And yeah, one of the parts uh, in, in the uh, series, they were talking about how pain is one of the vital signs. What, what, yeah, I think I remember what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. They yeah, kept they, on changing the definition over yeah, and over again. Yeah, and adding vital signs, adding, you know, uh, we see things like that. I think things to the human rights, everything becomes a human rights uh, every once right. in a while. Yep. 
Yeah, there's a lot of corruption. And I think, you know, people just, like I said, they, they are low dopamine, they want to be told what to do. Um, they don't want to necessarily think for themselves, they want to, you know, have everything be easy. And it's just, you know, it isn't, that's not the way that it is. I just, I don't ever since things happen with my daughter, my mind has been shifted in that way. And I just don't, I'm like, okay, I, let me look into that. You know, I don't walk around with fear all the time and I don't walk around with anger. I don't allow those. I did have those things for many years, but I don't allow those things to overtake my life because those are poison too. Those are poison, just like GMOs and glyphosate, you know, they're poison in a different way. Hmm. Uh, and that uh, TV series is really eye-opening and especially because it is on, on Hulu, all right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was on Hulu. It is on Hulu. It, it, it doesn't come from a kind of uh, edgy podcast or anything. It is something recorded in the history and it shows how these things work. And there are so many things that are not illegal, but still have room for real corruption to take place. It doesn't have to be illegal to be corrupt. For example, exactly. they could sign their friends from FDA as CEOs or some pe mm -hmm. people with power in their own co uh, company because of the service that they, uh, they've given to them, provided to them. And it wasn't even illegal. Right. Exactly. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how it works. You know, I interviewed Dr. Um, Dr. Anthony J. I don't know if you follow him at all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he's wonderful. I really, I really like him, enjoy talking with him and uh, work privately with him offline as well. And, you know, that's one of the things that we talked about in our interview a few months ago was that, you know, he used to work for Mayo you know, Clinic. Yeah, Mayo Clinic. And then he kind of saw the corruption and this hiring this person to hire this person and let's do this under the table. And he just, he couldn't couldn't participate in it anymore. And when you hear that from, you know, everyone's like, I need a double blind peer reviewed study to, uh, to believe this. And there's a lot of things that can be beneficial and helpful for us that there are no studies for, you know? Um, but again, that's that kind of low dopamine thinking of, I need a study. I need someone to tell me, um, I need someone to tell me what to do type of deal. And not not being willing to believe that there is some sort of corruption or a different story besides what's on the surface taking place, you know. And part, some part of it is closed mindedness. You know, exactly. Yeah. Very <laughs> closed minded. Absolutely. Yep. If you throw uh, throw uh, studies at them, it wouldn't change their mind uh, because this study doesn't come from the sources that they. Right. Learned it's not trust. peer reviewed. It's not this. It's not. I'm like, okay, well, make your own decision. I just tell, I'm like, people start to argue with me about sunlight and I'm like, okay, well don't then <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> you know, Keep doing what you're doing. It's if it's, if it's working for you, sure. Go ahead. Like, I'm just giving you the information. I'm just telling you what's helped me, what's helped my clients. I, you don't have to do anything. It's fine. Yeah, that's true. And um, I think you talked about, uh, have you taken, I mean, I, I made this note long ago. So this part of the note, I don't remember very clearly, but did you take Ritalin as a teenager or very I did prescribed? I did mm -hmm. for ADD and then um Zoloft Ritalin sleeping medications I was just put on a lot of stuff when I was 14 my parents had a pretty tumultuous relationship my dad ended up passing away when I was 18 we had a lot of um pretty tragic family stuff and so that was what my mom thought was best because it was at the time, all the drugs, the Prozac and all the antidepressants and the Ritalin and all that stuff was exploding, you know, it was the nineties and people are just late nineties. People are just starting to do these drugs and they're like, Oh, these, this is the solution here. And, uh, yeah. So I, I started with the pharmaceuticals at 14 and, um, 
it wasn't really until I, I was off of them when I was pregnant with my daughter. But then after I had her, I went back on, you know, Zoloft sleeping medication. I went on a bunch of this stuff. I was uh, Wellbutrin because my head was a mess. I was just a total wreck. And um, that was because I was vegan. <laughs> Wondered why my brain was so screwed up. Uh, but yeah, I was on a lot of medications and I haven't been on any medications at all since about, I think it's been like seven years that I've been off of pretty much everything. Um, and that I know is, I mean, part of that was just going paleo. I didn't even have to go carnivore or keto or anything like that. I just went, I just went paleo and started eating like regular real food, you know, um, going carnivore. And I still would struggle with bouts of depression and anxiety. And then when I went carnivore, one of the reasons I stayed carnivore for so long was that the mental health aspect, I was like, I don't get depressed. I don't feel like, you know, for the most part, I feel so good. And then I added the sun, the light piece on top of that. And it was like, oh, I don't, I don't ever think I need to go back to medications again, you know? So yeah. And I was diagnosed with all kinds of you know, depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. ADD. Uh, at one point, a doctor was like, you might have bipolar, but you're, you're kind of borderline. And I was like, this is not right. <laughs> I know I'm not bipolar, but if you answer the questionnaire in specific ways, yeah, you got some bipolar going on. Um, a lot of that was that I just was not taking care of my body. I was drinking alcohol. I was trying to mix alcohol and, and, uh, different pharmaceuticals. My diet was crappy. I was doing vegan diet and yeah, my mental health was a complete disaster. Mm, and back to Ritalin specifically, how did it mm -hmm. make you feel? Did it? Well, first you explain, and then I will talk about my own experience because I don't want to, uh, kind of direct your answer. I just want to Uh, see what effects uh, did it have on you and how was your experience with Ritalin specifically? I just, I don't know that it did a whole lot for me other than just kind of made me feel a little more like wired, you know? Um, the reason that I was given the Ritalin is because I couldn't focus in school um, because my parents were a freaking disaster. My home life was a mess. And that's why I couldn't focus in school. Um, so I don't really think that it did a whole lot for me. I quit, I quit taking it after a while um, mm -hmm. because I just was like, I just feel too hyper. You know, I feel like I had drank a bunch of coffee and I didn't even drink coffee at the time. <laughs> and for like a 14, 15 year old, it's like, yeah, I just, I didn't, I didn't really stick with that one. I started smoking mm -hmm. pot at the time too. And so that was... <laughs> That didn't help either, but yeah, I didn't have like a very long experience with Ritalin. It was just one of the many drugs that I was put on at the time to try to control my uh, inability to focus in school, you know, which was really more rooted to family things life. Things going on. Yeah. Home. Things were yeah. a mess. You can't, you can't fix that with a pill. Yeah, you need to exactly. be there for the person and talk to them and, and help them through the experience, not just give them pills, mm -hmm. you know? And in case of uh, Ritalin, I think that it's kind of irresponsible because it is like giving mm -hmm. someone who is uh, stressed more coffee to drink. Exactly. I, that's how stress. I felt. I just felt even like more stressed and just like hyper and like, I did not like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I loved Ritalin when I took it. Uh, yeah. And the way it made me feel I had never felt before. Uh, with keto and carnivore came and that clarity or some levels of that clarity came uh, back without the side effects um, and the thing about Ritalin was that if I kept taking it for example three days or so I would start having obsessive thoughts and rumination of thoughts and, mm -hmm. uh, and the feeling of doom and gloom mm -hmm. yeah that was what it made me feel but the Um, I mean, in many ways, the way that coffee made me feel, Ritalin made me feel that way too. But the good thing about 
uh, Ritalin was that I could just not take it without any headache, any yeah. withdrawal uh, side effects. Yeah. Yeah. I ended up giving it away to my friends. <laughs> <laughs> For free? Yeah, I was just like, just take it. I don't want it. <laughs> they were like, sure, we'll snort it. You know? <laughs> you know uh, kids in high school like all right mm -hmm. cool I don't need it <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I ended up doing with that one <laughs> mm -hmm. and about uh, uh, ba baby health and carnivore mm -hmm. and also the other uh, things that you do for your health and you also say that they can be more important such as light can you talk mm -hmm. about all the things that you are doing for uh, having a healthy baby and mm -hmm. for those who don't know, uh, Sarah, Sarah's uh, expecting now. Mm -hmm. 24 weeks tomorrow. So six months mm -hmm. tomorrow. Great. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, preconception was very important. That's, I think, something that we don't place enough importance on is preparing the body for pregnancy. I think people are like, all right, I'm ready to get pregnant. But you need to start making sure that your body has uh, proper minerals, proper nutrients before you get pregnant because the baby comes and then they take a lot of the nutrients. So you need to kind of nutrient load. And so one of the things that I was really making sure I was doing was eating um, the salmon row, the fish eggs. I've been really consistent with those for a couple of years now. Um, I eat like a spoonful of those probably like five days a week because the DHA is so super important for brain health. And then you've got iodine, selenium, zinc, copper, you know, there, it, it has a lot of essential minerals. Um, also of course the circadian rhythms, that's very, very, very important as well for hormonal balance, because if you have low testosterone and low DHEA, which is something I had, then your egg quality is not, is going to suffer so that the egg that makes the baby is not going to be as healthy. And so I had to do all the sun protocols in order to help with my hormonal balance. I also did, uh, and I still do red light therapy. Um, I did that, um, on my abdomen, probably five days a week. Now I don't do it on my abdomen. Cause there's just not a lot of studies that show pregnancy and red light therapy. I'll do it on my legs, my back, um, my face, but I kind of cover my belly. Cause I just don't really, we don't really know. I don't think it's going to, it would hurt anything, but that was one of the things I did to help prepare because it increases your, um, blood flow, which is important to get blood flow to the reproductive organs to again, have healthy eggs, healthy reproductive organs and increases your, um, boost your mitochondrial function. So everything is built around the mitochondria. You know, if you want to have a healthy baby, you want to have healthy mitochondria. And so the circadian rhythms contributes to that, the light hygiene, red light therapy, grounding. I did cold therapy for, October, November, December, half of January, because if you're trying to get pregnant, you don't, you, you can't cold plunge the, during the two weeks mm -hmm. that you're trying to get the embryo to implant. You can't do that because it will not implant. <laughs> so, um, I had to figure that out, but, um, yeah, I did cold therapy, cold plunging up to the neck in ice cold water three days a week. Um, that also helped because that improves mitochondrial function. It actually speeds up um, what's called the electron transport chain. It makes the electrons travel faster in the electron transport chain, which is a, just another way of saying improves your mitochondrial health <laughs> and reverse ages your cells. Um, Cause I'll, I'm 43. So it's, you know, it's women are having trouble getting pregnant in their twenties and thirties. Sure. I mean, that's, it's a crisis happening right now but forties is even harder. So that's why I had to do so many things. Um, also minerals. I drink, uh, Quinton minerals every day in my water. I drink high quality spring water. I'm a big water snob. I structure all my water. I bring my water with me <laughs> like wherever I go. I don't drink the water. I don't drink tap water. Um, yeah, I've just done a lot of things. Um, to improve my health. I mean, the nutrition piece is a huge part of that. Like I drink, um, you know, raw milk from a farm, raw cream, um, 
high quality grass fed meat, lamb, eggs, uh, fish eggs, you know, lots of protein, lots and lots of protein, lots of good, healthy fats, butter, uh, raw butter when I can get it. And yeah, I mean, I've just, I always just think like, if it's healthy for me, it's healthy for the baby. And then you look at what cultures did ancestrally, they would always gather the, the salmon row, the fish eggs to give to the women for preconception and while pregnant, because they believe that was the most nutrient dense food to give the mothers in our ancient civilizations. And so you know, we, my husband buys the special fish eggs. There's only one company I like. And so he has it shipped to the house. <laughs> it's a little expensive, but he, my husband's on board. He's like, you, she, she has to have her fish eggs, you know, it's better. Fish oil capsules can be rancid. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of them are rancid that can cause it's like ingesting seed oils. Yeah. You know, we talk about how terrible seed oils are. If you're ingesting those fish oil capsules, it's the same thing almost as a seed oil. Um, maybe not every brand, but a lot of the brands are rancid and DHA is heat and light sensitive. So the best way to get your DHA is through food, you know, and it's hard when you're pregnant and you're not feeling that well, the first trimester, but, um, you know, you want to start doing this stuff six months to a year before you actually become pregnant or two years if you can. And how do you eat the salmon roe? You just eat a, spoon, uh, a spoonful of it or do you? I just eat a spoonful of it. Yeah. Usually eat it with eggs in the morning for breakfast and um, yeah, just eat it by the spoonful. It's not uh, the first trimester I was gagging <laughs> a lot with it, but <laughs> It was just one of those things I was like, all right, this is for the baby. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take it. I also do organ uh, meat capsules. I take those um, daily. I take brain, um, spleen, heart, liver, lung, pancreas. You know, I do the, like the multi blend and uh, take those daily. And I take desiccated oyster capsules also when I can't, because I can't get oysters as easily here, but those are an amazing superfood for fertility and pregnancy as well. And uh, why do you get uh, the desiccated uh, uh, organs in capsules? Do you, uh, don't you like the taste or you're not accustomed to it? Is that the reason? Um, I don't love preparing organ meats. If I make them, no one else will eat them. We'll, we'll make uh, sweet breads every now and then. Um, mm -hmm. my family won't really eat liver though. So, and you don't need a lot of it. You don't really need to yeah. be eating tons of it. So, and I don't take like the six capsules a day that they recommend. I only take three of the capsules. So, because we didn't eat tons and tons of organ meats, but they are important to give us those B vitamins, folate, you know, there's so many essential nutrients we can get from organ meats. I'm just not a big fan of preparing them, of the taste, of all that stuff. I will eat the um, the carnivore crisps. I'm sure you've seen those. I've got mm -hmm. these here. Actually, people, I'm in my office. These are the beef liver. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I'll eat those. And they have, um, they have a heart, uh, beef or the heart crisps also. So I eat those. My daughter eats those. But you know, sometimes it's easier to take the desiccated. <laughs> the desiccated supplement than eat the the chips you know yeah uh, the good thing about my culture is that and they're considered kind of delicacy and ah they, yes uh, yeah we are accustomed to uh, to eating them so if uh, one it, it is not that one member of the family would eat them and the others would not everyone would fight over them. everyone would eat, yeah see that's a that's a problem with the american culture is like we've just lost the um you know lost the value of the organ meats and it's not something that you can go to a restaurant and order it's you know you really have to do it all yourself. And we, ha I don't know a lot of good recipes, but yeah, it's a lot of other cultures that do this are one of our therapists, um, her family's from Cuba and they eat, you know, the heart and they eat, you know, all the different organs. It's like you said, it's a delicacy, but here you don't really see that at all. Uh, here, I, uh, I mean, in Poland, that I, I am currently living in Poland, and it's a challenge to get beef organs. 
uh, you can get um, pork um, organs and chicken organs, but not um, beef. I recently, mm -hmm. I mean, by recently, I mean, over, maybe it is even a year. It's been, it's probably been a year that I've been, I found a shop that uh, sells dark food, including ah. the food that no one else would eat except for me. <laughs> I think <laughs> everyone who gets it, they get it for their dog, but I get the ah. <laughs> beef bone and also the beef uh, liver. Nice. Yeah, I love marrow bones. I could, I roast mm. the marrow bones. That's one of my favorite things to eat is, uh, is marrow. I eat it raw or roasted. It's delicious, but mm. yeah. Yeah, we've just started feeding my dog raw within the last few months here. And I have, I found a, a farm that they mix everything and just send it in a big container, but it's like all the organs and, um, the fat and the marrow, they just mix it all together. And then I, I give it to her. Uh, she loves it. She absolutely loves it with goat. They give you, um, goat milk and bone broth just for the dogs. So mm -hmm. yeah, she gets all the good stuff now. And if you yourself want to make uh, a broth, would you add vegetables to it or you would just? No, not mm -hmm. unless I wanted to for, you know, to add a little different taste, but of all the times I've made my broth, I really never add any vegetables. Cause I just don't, I just don't see the need for it. You know, you just get enough good marrow bones in there, maybe some oxtail. Um, yeah, I, I, I've never really been one to add a lot of vegetables to broth. I'm not saying you can't, or there's no value in it. You can definitely get some, some different mineral profiles into your broth if you add some vegetables, but I just really don't when I make my broths. And so it is just, it's basically just the water, salt, and mm -hmm. the meat, right? And I put a little apple cider vinegar in there also to help, you know, pull out some of the minerals from the bones. Mm -hmm. Anything for the for the smell for changing the smell or the taste? No, my husband wishes that I did, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> he gets annoyed when I make my broth. He's like, "Oh God, are you making your broth again?" I'm like, "Get over it." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I live in a shared flat, and yeah, I have to find uh, the right time for making it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't bother, the smell doesn't bother me at all, but my husband is like, mm -hmm. oh, gross. <laughs> yeah. yeah. For me, it's still, it, it, it's taking some time for me to transition to full zero um, plant. I, I, I mean, the latest version I made was with some onions, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Or the other one that I don't remember. The English word for it's something green it is like the uh there's green onions too uh peppers onions maybe we call it a green onion there's green yeah. onions too yeah, oh, yeah. those yeah, yeah. yeah the yeah. last version I made was only with that and some onions and I think I am making the transition to making a zero plant version and I was yeah. wondering maybe there was some trick for uh removing the the smell I haven't one. found one. I have not found one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And you're, you're just accustomed to it. I can. Uh, yeah. I'm used right? to it now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just add a little salt when I'm drinking it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. For yeah. me, uh, becoming carnivore happened and I couldn't even imagine that I could one day eat meat, just, just meat and nothing else uh, at the yeah. side. And I was like, yeah, I can I cannot uh, remove the spices, but now I oh simply yeah, that's don't. a that's a big one. Yeah, yeah. simply I found myself having re removed them, and I was totally comfortable with that. Yeah, I was the same way, and they just every now and then it can be fine to add those in, and I think it's it can be a little nice change, but on a daily basis, I haven't I don't really find the need for it. I just don't really have the taste for it. Mm -hmm. What's your view on dairy, raw milk, cream? 
I think if someone's trying to uh, lose weight, they probably should not eat those foods. <laughs> they're not good if you're if you're doing if you're trying to lose weight. Um, but I think they're incredibly healthy. I think that there are in raw, not pasteurized. Mm -hmm. um, there are amazing minerals and nutrients that you can only get in the raw form than, uh, than if you would go and just get the pasteurized. I think pasteurized is what causes a lot of allergies, mm. a lot of issues, a lot of gut problems. Um, but even with raw, I think you really need to make sure your gut is healthy and in a good place. Uh, which can take some time, you know? So I, I think it's, it's helpful if somebody just wants to try doing an elimination diet to not have those things in. I didn't have those things in at all. Um, in the very beginning, probably for the first 90 days, I didn't do any dairy at all. And then I just added the raw dairy within the last year, I would say I wasn't even really doing a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Um, before like the last year, but we have a, a local farm. I get, raw milk delivered and, um, raw cheese and raw butter and all of that stuff. And I love it. It's delicious, but you know, after pregnancy, when I'm trying to lose pregnancy weight, I don't know. I don't know how much of that, that I probably won't be eating as much of it. Like I am now I'm kind of just enjoying it all right now. It's delicious to me. Mm -hmm. With respect to pregnancy again, and uh, following the carnivore diet, have you changed anything? I, I mean, have you included something that was not carnivore in it? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, first trimester, I couldn't, um, stick to carnivore because I was nauseous all the time. I had to eat more often. Um, so first trimester I had, you know, some things like potatoes because that they helped to settle my stomach, um, <clears throat> eating just meat at that time was really hard. I lost, I felt nauseous when I smelled meat. I had mm. to just, yeah, it was hard. It was very hard to get those nutrients in the carnivore bar, um, helped me a ton, uh, Philip Mises product, the carnivore bar, because they're kind of like, uh, I called it my meat saltine. And oh. so it was like a meat cracker. So that's the only way I was really able to get a lot of, uh, protein in the first trimesters. I would just eat the carnivore bars. Um, but now second trimester after about week 14, I started feeling really good and I can, I've mostly just switched back to primarily carnivore. Uh, but I have had like some seasonal fruit with yogurt. I get, I make, make yogurt with the milk from the farm, um, and whatever's in season, you know, so it was, uh, strawberries and then it was cherries. And now we're getting some peaches, things like that. But I always mix it with a protein and a fat. I never just have it by itself um, because that's not, it's not great for your blood sugar to just kind of have fruit by itself. So mm. I have added a few things like that in, but I still eat like a really good amount of um, red meat, eggs, and uh, wild fish, things like that. So primarily still carnivore. For sourcing raw milk, I guess uh, I should be learning. I, I first need to learn more Polish so that I can interact with locals and yeah. get some. Yeah. In, in otherwise, I I haven't found them in shops. Some uh, friends have told me that you can find them at certain even chain stores, mm. but I really doubt that maybe. And they have some standards, and if it passes those standards, they call it raw, but it is not really raw. Uh. Okay. I think I have covered the questions that I had in mind. Uh, would you like uh, to add anything? I feel like you've <laughs> been very, very thorough, um, for sure. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for having me on and, and chatting with me, but yeah, you've, I feel like you've covered a lot of topics for sure. That was, that was a great chat and thanks for, um, for your time and you're welcome. yeah, yeah. Your generosity in sharing information with us. Thank you so much. Absolutely. You're very welcome. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of Round the Fire. If you are watching this video on YouTube, Please give it a like and hit the subscribe button. 
If you're listening to the podcast, please leave the five star review. It would cost you nothing but help me a great deal, especially if you do so on Apple Podcasts. Also, if you feel particularly generous, consider supporting me via Patreon, PayPal, or Bitcoin.